Welcome to Mysteries, Myths, and Legends. I'm Taylor. I'm Savannah. Welcome to the show. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hi, everyone. Um, this week is, I guess, extra special because, you know, it almost didn't happen. We kind of yeah, um, ran true. into some roadblocks, um, some technical difficulties, but we're, you know, you know we're, we're pushing here. through. We made it, we made it through somehow. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, in the middle of all the times we tried to do this, me and Savannah did, in fact, go see the new Hunger Games movie. Yes. The Ballad oh of God. Songbirds and Snakes. It was amazing. Oh, um, if you, I'm just going to say this. If you ever watched the Hunger Games, enjoyed the Hunger Games, read them, go and watch this. Like, we didn't, we went into this, like, we had not read the book. Mm. Mm-mm. Like, no. I might, I'm going to go read the book after Me this. Too. And I'm, like, fully back into my Hunger Games era. <laughs> Quite literally. like, obsessed. <laughs> no, literally. We went and saw it the other day. I have already wa- rewatched all the movies. I'm on the last one. Like, literally pause mm-hmm. it. I think I have, like, 45 minutes left of the last one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm fully addicted again. Back to 2012 yeah. <laughs> when mm-hmm. I was first addicted to this you know maybe yeah. even before then i don't know when i read the books yeah like honestly i don't know what i expected but i just did not expect that it would be Mm-mm. as good as it was like well, it just no yeah is so i don't know yeah it was a really good movie i feel like it would be a good movie even if you had no idea about the hunger games yeah no no you're definitely right because yeah it's you don't crazy. really need to know you don't really need to know about all of the background Mm-mm. information um but it's just like extra, like an extra layer there if you do know it all. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's um, really good. Go see yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Definitely must do um, that. Like, we could all, honestly, like, I could do a whole other podcast just on this. <laughs> no, this podcast. <laughs> the people already know. We go, we talk about what we watch on here, but no, we could fully go into a deep dive. Like, we were talking about how we could write papers. On yes, that movie. no, literally. Yeah, oh, we walked. So good. We walked out of the theater in awe. We were just like, yeah. "What just happened?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really think that that's probably like the best movie I've seen in a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To have shocked me the way it did, and just it was a roller coaster. And now I think I'm gonna go see it in 4DX this weekend, which is I'm kind of jealous. Literally, be like a roller coaster. I mean, honestly, go with me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because you know, if you don't know, 4DX is like. The moving seats, they have, like, the wind, the water, all the elements. Yeah, I've never done anything no. with that. I've never watched a full movie. I've, like, played games and stuff like that, but never a full movie. So, yeah. it seems interesting. Some of my friends went and watched The Little Mermaid in 4DX, and they said they got really oh, wow. wet. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> I, you know, it sounds fun mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But speaking of other things... Um, I have not even asked you this, Savannah. Have you heard of the docu-series called, I can't even remember what it's called, but it's like Twin Flames Universe or something oh, like that on um, Netflix? Maybe? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't okay. Know. Well, it's new, and it's about this cult who believes in, like, twin flames and, like, oh. your twin flame being the love of your life or whatever. And it's probably... One of the craziest documentaries I've seen in a while. Um, There's only three episodes. And I don't want to spoil anything. So I'm not going to say anything else other than if you have the time and like three hours, you should watch it. Because it's really crazy. And the leader is like, I'm not a cult leader. Um, Unfortunately, hate to break it to him. He definitely is. (laughs) Okay. um, Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I don't exactly remember what it's called. But it's like Twin Flames something. And okay. it'll come up. So go watch that because it's absolutely wild. <laughs> okay. I'm, a- I'm adding it to my list. Good. As you should. Well, anyway, mm-hmm. I guess things to watch aside. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Go check out our Instagram and our YouTube, um, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. then go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as per usual. But mm-hmm. other than that, I don't really have any other intro topics. What about you? Um, I think I think that's it. We could, I mean, honestly, we could just talk and talk forever. But let's get into the story that you came here for. Let's do it. 
so this week I have one that I'm like I'm pretty excited to talk about um have you heard of Forsyth Park in Savannah Georgia uh yeah I think I've been there yeah you probably (laughs) if you've been to Savannah you probably I have I think I've been there yeah because it's it's like one of the most photographed places in Georgia Mm mm-hmm and it's like very beautiful. It's um it got this fountain. Mhm. Yep. Yep. Um and the fountain was actually installed in 1858, so super old. Um there's like a paved walkway to the fountain and it's lined with century old oak trees um that are draped in Spanish moss. Mhm. Yeah, Love so Spanish if moss. you can if you can picture all of that, very pretty. Um very just what you would picture if you were in Savannah, Georgia, honestly. Um, but this place has a secret. It's it's haunted. Okay, that's crazy because I really didn't even know. Yeah. So it's it's haunted in a way that like, okay, the reason it's it they people say it's haunted is because it's surrounded by buildings that are haunted. Oh, in, okay, that's interesting. So. Yeah. So you you've said you've been to this park. Um mm-hmm. there's like buildings yeah all around it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like in the middle of the city, right? Yeah, it is. So, um yeah, three of the buildings that are down there, um people say are haunted and I'm going to go over each of them. So, it's kind of like a 3 for 1 deal this Ooh, time. Oh, okay. We love that. Um yeah. So the Haunted places in question are the mansion on Forsyth Park, a.k.a. the Lewis Caton House, mm-hmm. um, the Forsyth Park Inn, um, and the Old Candler Hospital. Ooh. I so, really cannot believe that place is considered haunted. <laughs> and I didn't know yeah. about it before I went there. Yeah, honestly. Um, uh, I, I feel like that whole area, though, like... When once you get like that south, it's just all haunted, right? No, it's true. Like, it's do you true. feel? There? Yeah, like Charleston is like another one where it's just like yes, yeah, Wilmington, exactly. all it's those just areas. everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the first one I'm going to talk about is the mansion on Forsyth Park, um, aka the Lewis Caton House. Um, this one is probably the least haunted, so I just thought I'd start with it because there's not. There's honestly not much to say, but we'll just go over it. So this was originally the house of Lewis Caton. He was a businessman from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, And then he just moved down south, I guess. Um, It's a beautiful terracotta building. And it was built between 1888 and 1889. Um, So he, he lived in it for a while. And then in... 1953 the building became fox and weeks funeral home and it was a funeral home for over 50 years i see i see yeah so this is the reason that people say that it is haunted because it was a funeral home um and it is now so it's not a funeral home anymore it is now a 126 room hotel oh okay (laughs) With, which, like, that's not just the original house. Like, they added stuff onto it. Yeah. But it, it covers 18,000 square feet and, you know, has this addition and everything. But the original house is, like, the lounge and restaurant of the hotel. hmm And they even have, like, a cooking school there. So Ooh. that's cool. Very um, fancy. But, yeah, people say that it's haunted because it was a funeral home for such a long time. Um, yeah. But uh, honestly, like, I didn't even see that many stories about ghosts being here. Um, I mean, guests at the hotel have seen some, but it's not really anything too crazy. Mm-hmm. But it's just, like, adding on to these other ones that I'm going to talk about, then it's like, okay, you know, it adds on to the hauntedness. For sure. For sure, for sure. Plus, I mean, I honestly feel like any funeral home is just going to be haunted. Oh, like, yeah. Like, that's the last place your body's going to be before it's either burned or buried, like, you Yeah, know? true. It's a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, the next one I'm going to talk about, 
um, is the Forsyth Park Inn. So this inn, it I'm started confused. Are there as a two home. hotels on this park? Because the other uh, one, like, so yeah. they're separate hotels? Yep. Or inns or whatever so, you want to call it. Yeah. So the first one that I talked about, it was the mansion on Forsyth Park. Mm-hmm. And this one's the Forsyth Park Inn. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so they're both, like, yeah, <laughs> overlooking the park, but they're separate. Okay, cool. Yeah. Got it. Um, and they both used to be houses. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, this one started out as a home as well. And it was originally known as the Churchill Manor. And it was home of Aaron Churchill and his family. Nice, fancy. Yes. So they settled in Savannah in the 1890s and Aaron, he transported cotton in and out of Savannah and invested in local cotton plantations in the area and made a fortune off of the cotton industry. Mm, I way. bet he did. Yeah. Which unfortunately, I mean, if we're talking about the South and like ghosts and stuff it's like it's gonna be a lot of this kind of stuff for like sure. plantations and for sure yeah yep um so yeah he and his wife lois um they had everything they had this beautiful house like all this money from you know the like the cotton industry that i don't even want to go into how right. bad it was but um yeah, they had they had whatever they wanted, but they could not conceive a child. Mm, didn't have everything you so, wanted, did you? Yeah, so <laughs> they really wanted to have a kid, but they couldn't. Hmm, tragic. But in 19, or sorry, taking it back farther than that, 1899, uh, Lois's niece, uh, Lottie, she came to live with them. Okay, so, so they had like a, a kid. Yeah, yeah, they, they took her in and they loved her and treated her as their own daughter. Um, and then when Lottie was 14, another woman came to stay at the home um, and it was Lois's sister, Anna. So Lottie and Anna, they got along really well. Um, Lottie even thought of Anna as like a big sister after they bonded together for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So they were having, a, they had like a great relationship and it was like all going good. They were a big happy family um, until one night Lottie, she was getting ready for bed and she saw her aunt Lois and uncle Aaron like hugging each other down at the end of the hall. Mm -hmm. But then she got a little bit closer and realized that it was not Stop. her aunt Lois. It was Anna. Stop it right now yeah so she was shocked obviously she was like oh. this is gonna ruin my whole family like yeah they're gonna split up and everything's gonna be ruined so she and she felt betrayed by anna too but then she thought she was like i'm i need to get rid of her oh <laughs> okay that wouldn't have been my next thought but okay. yeah no that was her thought immediately so, the next morning, literally, okay. Lottie prepared tea for Anna. Oh. <laughs> and she slipped something into her tea. Mm -hmm. some, some sort of poison from the garden. She mm -hmm. slipped it into her tea. And Anna took a sip. She, she was just drinking her tea. And she began to choke. Oh, no. And she fell down and died. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. My question is, why was it Anna's fault? Because Anna wasn't the one that was married. Right. I mean, See, of course, Anna exactly. had a play in it, but. And also, like, I don't know. It, this The story that I read was just like that they were, they had an embrace. Like, they were just like Yeah, hugging. they were hugging. Yeah, that's what I was so like. Maybe like, they were just, she was like, thank you so much for letting me stay here. Right. Yeah. So I don't really know. Like, maybe she just read it wrong or something. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe, maybe she, didn't. she just maybe. really wanted to take her out regardless because it, even if I saw that something happened, I, my first thought isn't let's take her out. 
<laughs> I mean, maybe. I don't know. They they seem like they were ha getting along really well, though. But then that was just what pushed her over the edge because she just wanted yeah, this perfect family. She wanted her, like, you know, quote unquote, parents to stay together. Yeah. So that's Definitely. why she didn't go after Aaron because mm -hmm. she's like, well, he has to stay with her. So. Yeah. So, yeah, she died. Um, and then Lottie, she... Um, Lottie was thinking about, like, oh, sorry, I, I took it back too far. <laughs> I gotta go back to my space. <laughs> you know, it happens. She, okay, at the funeral, um, Lois and Lottie, they started talking about Anna, and this is a big plot twist. Lottie learned the truth about Anna. Oh, no. She was her biological mother. <gasps> no. Whoa, whoa, yep. whoa, 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 whoa. Back it up. Yep. Wait. Okay. Yeah, because I said it was oh. Lo it was Lois's niece, and then it, she took in her sister. Yeah. But she yeah. just didn't know. Yeah, she didn't know. Because mm. mm -mm, I guess mm -mm, she was so mm -mm. young that she didn't remember her mother. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Wow. So, at the time... Anna was not able to provide for Lottie, so she sent her to live with Lois and Aaron. And then no. as she, you know, started to, she, like, was living her own life, but then she couldn't take care of herself either. So, or I think she was injured or sick or something, so she went to go stay with them as well. My job but yeah, on the no, floor. But they never, they never told her. Oh, she I killed know. her mom. That's yeah. so bad. They definitely were not yes. even cheating on each other. I mean, more than likely. I don't know. I mean, maybe they were, but regardless, girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's tough. Yeah. So, Lottie, she was obviously so horrified. Like, I guess she wasn't horrified before when she killed a person, but when, when she found it was her, her mom, yeah. she was like, okay, well, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that's so, so bad. She was so horrified. She couldn't bear what she did. So she kind of like went insane over it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, this is the 1800s. She was committed to an asylum. Of course she was. Yeah. I, yeah. I knew that one was coming. <laughs> and yeah. And she lived out her days there. Oh, wow. So. Wow. Yep. Well, honestly, and to be quite fair, I think she really needed it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if she poisoned somebody like, yeah. yeah. Like on that quick of an impulse. And they were friends. Imagine right. if you weren't friends with her. Right, yeah. Mm. yeah. Don't get on Lottie's bad side. Mm-hmm. So, Aaron Churchill died in 1920 and Lois in 1929. And after they passed, um, the home was sold and used as a boarding home. And then after that, it was sold again and turned into the Forsyth Park Inn um, in the 1980s. So, since it's been the inn, because um, that's what it currently is, um, visitors claim to see a girl in a white dress in the halls on the st and on the stairwell. Um, and some say that this is Lottie, but some say that it's Anna. Oh, that's crazy. So. Well. Yeah. That's a big difference right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I guess it could be either one and they probably look alike because, you know, they're yep. family. <laughs> yeah, they sure are. Um, so in rooms 10 and 11, which are in the basement, um, they are the most haunted, which, you know, basements. Okay. Why are, why are the rooms in the basement? That, that's what I want to know. I don't know. See, but. Maybe it's, like, only a partial basement where it's, like, still out of the ground a little bit and there's windows. I mean, I would That's what I would guess. So, also because Savannah yeah. is, like, literally, like, an ocean city. Yeah. So. Maybe it's just ground floor. Yeah. Creepy, if not. Probably mm -hmm. creepy regardless because they're haunted, so. Yeah. Um, room 8 on the second floor also has some paranormal activity. Um, they have some... They, or people have heard footsteps... And a child's laughter, mm -mm. which is always fun. Immediate now. And the TV turning on by itself. Ooh. Well, I just want to watch some TV. 
Yeah, honestly. True. So yeah, that is the um, Forsyth Park Inn, which is, yeah, sounds pretty um, haunted uh, um, yeah. and has a really good <laughs> dramatic story. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of want to stay there. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say, I love Savannah. We should definitely go back and definitely stay there. That story had me shook. I was not expecting that Pfft, mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, and when we stay there, we can also see this last one that I'm going to talk about, the Old Candler Hospital. Oh, yeah. So this one, this one had me. Mm. <laughs> well, the other one had me. Wait, so is this... Okay, you'll get into it. Just go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so the Old Candler Hospital opened in 1804. And it's actually the second oldest hospital for continuously operating in the country. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. Is it still a hospital today? And so, yes. Kind of. So, I feel like they're cheating a little bit with this. Okay. Because it is still operating technically, but it's not in the same building. Well, that's so a it's lie. Like, they're saying, oh, it's the same hospital, but we just moved to a different building. Mm -hmm. And it's like a few miles away. It's okay. still in the same area, but it's like the the old building is still there and it's actually now a law school or something. Okay. So Yeah. That's just debatable. I know, I know. I kept reading that it was still like <laughs> operating and I'm like and then I looked it up on Google Maps and I was like, That's mm -hmm. not where it is though, it's not by the park. Yeah. See, so and that's then, what I was yeah, gonna say. So. I was like I, there's no way I missed two inns and a working hospital while I was yeah. at the park. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess now it's a law. It's a law school. Okay. So that I don't makes, know if you saw that, but makes sense. Yeah. So this hospital originally was built as a medical facility for those who were injured at, at sea and got or like got sick at sea, because um, you know Savannah is a coastal mm -hmm. town. Um, yeah. a lot of sailors would come by and yeah, need, need a hospital. Makes sense. So it was originally known as the Savannah hospital. And then the hospital was actually endowed to the founder of Coca-Cola. What? Which is interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then he named it after his brother who would lead the hospital, um, Aiken Clan. Uh, Candler, so it became the Candler Hospital. Oh, okay. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah, I read that. I was like, Coca-Cola. Like, what? They're, they're getting involved in the story now? Right. I mean, they are rich, so. Yeah. I guess they could find their way into any of these stories. Mm -hmm. but. So, eventually, um, I said that weird. Eventually, <laughs> the hospital merged with St. Joseph's Hospital which I guess is a, a big hospital in the area. And that's when they moved to the other building. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So, but while it was still at its original uh, building, um, the yellow fever epidemic hit the area pretty mm -hmm. hard. Not good. Not good at all. Yeah. I know we've we've definitely talked about yellow fever on this podcast before. Yeah, but I don't even remember what yellow fever is. <laughs> so, okay, let me let me try to summarize a little bit. I don't actually have notes on what yellow fever is, but I kind of <laughs> remember. Yeah. So we're just going to go through it. <laughs> so yellow fever, it you get it by getting bit by an infected mosquito. Oh, okay. Yep. And... The yellow fever epidemic, actually, there were, like, multiple epidemics throughout the whole United States mm -hmm. many times over literally, like, a 20-year period. Mm -hmm. Like, people were just constantly getting yellow fever, and it was horrible. It's it, so yeah, scary. I would never want to, like, like you, you think about, oh, what era would you want to go back to <gasps> yeah, in none. a time machine? None. Never, anyone, any time that had yellow fever, because that seemed awful. Um, or like so any of the diseases. I mean, true, <laughs> true. But yellow fever was just a big one in America. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's still around in um, some countries, but in most of the world, it's not really around anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, I just looked it up. Apparently, we have a vaccine now. Yes, so, yep. uh, we love that for modern 
medicine. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, yellow fever, it causes, like, the skin to turn yellow. Mm. Like, you get jaundice, jaundice, right? And your eyes. Yeah. And you just get a really bad fever and, like, just are sick. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know how to describe. Mm -hmm. Well, like, yeah, like, jaundice is, like, a liver disease. Basically, it means, like, your livers are shutting down when you turn yellow like that. Because my mm -hmm. brother had jaundice. Yeah. So, scary. Not good. Not good yes. at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Fun times. Um, yeah, fun this, times. <laughs> with this the hospital, This hospital had to deal with yellow fever for a lot um for a big chunk of the time when it um i guess right after it opened 1804 and i think yeah in the 1800s sometime i thought i had the year here but i guess i don't um 18 uh, like the 1880s ish was when it was around savannah i think um but yeah, it was a it was a really big crisis. Um, yeah, and this and also there is something to mention. So once you get yellow fever once, um, apparently like you won't get it again. It's one of those things. Um, but you have to survive it first. Obviously. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I mean so. that, that makes sense. But you know, will you survive it? That's the question. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't know if you can hear that. Parm is scratching at the door. Oh, She's I trying didn't. To get in. I didn't, but hello, Parm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yellow fever, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so this hospital had 384 beds, which is, I mean, mm, not, not enough. that much for a hospital. No, not enough at all. Yeah. And they also had an underground tunnel. Um, and that's okay. where this story takes its turn. I see where this is going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So this tunnel runs from Candler Park or from, sorry, not Candler Park, from Candler Hospital underneath the park. What? Supposedly. Oh, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. It was used to transport the bodies of those who had passed from yellow fever um, because, you know, they didn't want people to see how many people were dying of yellow fever. Yeah. I mean, that does was, make sense. It was a lot. Mm. So they had to hide the bodies. Yeah, kind of. Yikes. So it was said that the tunnel would be filled with bodies during the day. And then at night, a horse-drawn carriage would, like, load them up. Or they would load them up on a carriage and take them out to be buried. And it was all done secretly. Wow. But also, another story says that, like, the tunnel may not have had an exit. And it was, like, just from the hospital to underground. And it just didn't end. And they just, like, kept them all under there. Mm. Like the catacombs, almost. Mm, yeah, that's, a, yep, that, that, that's the vibe I'm getting. So, I don't know what the truth is there. There's not really proof either way. Hmm, interesting. So, we are like, we, like debatable if these sh shoots are down there like these tunnels are okay. like they're down there well let me let me just say this no record of a tunnel um under the park like there's no record mm. of a tunnel under there but there was an article in the savannah morning newspaper in 1884 that discusses that there is going to be a tunnel constructed under the hospital to replace the above ground morgue mm-hmm yeah, that definitely is giving there the tunnel <laughs> under there. Yeah, and because if there what are... else would they have done with the bodies? Right. Like if right. nobody really did see like that many bodies going in and out of there. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. Suspicious. And like even if it's not under the park, like people, some people I saw online were saying that it might not be a tunnel directly underneath this park, but could be like next to it, like. Going a different way, underground. Oh, if that okay. Makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. So, like, still coming from the hospital, but not. Yeah, a different under the direction. park. Yeah. Per se. So I don't know. I don't know. But either way, it's not great. I mean, I guess you had to do what you had to do, but. I mean, yeah. Of course they <laughs> they had to, but like, mm, 
looking back, like, that's not the best idea. Yeah, I would like say. thinking about it, it's like, are there bodies just under there? I, I'm sure there are. I am positive that there are. Like, think about the catacombs. And that building is a school now. Like, could you just get under there? That's what I want to know. Like, can can we access these quote unquote alleged tunnels? I bet if there like you think was... they're filled up now. Maybe. Or they just, like, blocked it off that you can't get in. Yeah. Legally. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just kidding for anybody listening. But, hmm. That's very interesting. I would love to go there because now we have to go there. To Savannah. First of all, I love Savannah. Also, you're Savannah. Have you been to Savannah? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah, my my aunt lives by there, so... Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah. And I have a hoodie. I have a hoodie that says Savannah, Georgia, and I wear it all the time. Amazing. <laughs> it's my Amazing. favorite one. <laughs> that's what. That's also where um, Bonaventure Cemetery is with the yes. yeah. girl that I went and saw. So, mm-hmm. but like we could. Here's my idea and thought process: is like if we went to this hospital slash law school now, we could ask somebody from there. You know? Yeah. True. True. <laughs> Like, they might not give us a straight answer, but they might. You never know. We've mm-hmm. never really been shut down that too hard in the past when we asked a question. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. We could do it. Um, but, yeah, with all of these buildings together in the same area, it's just, like, an aura of, like, death, even over a place that's so beautiful. And it's just crazy because it's, like, I don't know. It just makes you view it all differently. No, definitely. Like, what all went down here it's like oh. right and also like if the tunnel thing at that one hospital is true also just, let's just pretend and imagine that these tunnels actually do go under the park that's a lot of activity paranormal right at that park yeah. like if for regardless that's crazy that the park is like the epicenter <laughs> of this and i bet I hope that, like, what if Lottie and Anna just, like, walk around the park together? Like, if they, yeah, if they do (laughs) both haunt that place, like, I hope they got over her murdering Anna, you know, like, Lottie murdering Anna. And I hope that they've rekindled the relationship as mother and daughter. Yeah. And I I do hope that they walk the park together. Somebody cue that Hamilton line. You wouldn't know it, Savannah, but somebody out there is singing it. Yeah. Yeah. But that is, that's my story. So. Wow. Well, that was a good one that I had no idea about at all. And I'm just very shocked. Yeah. And also, like, the foot traffic that that place gets yes, of yeah. living people yeah. every day, insane. Because, like, that's, yeah. like, the main part of Savannah. Like, that you, mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the main things you would go see. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely bananas, if you ask me. Well, I guess, moving along to my story, I actually have for you what's going to be a two-parter. I know, I know, how dare I make us wait for the end of the story. (laughs) But, you know, this one, it's just too long. And, like, I don't know if we would want a two-hour episode. So, we're going to do a regular timed episode, and you're going to just have to wait till next week to hear the next one. And... So this week, it is a little bit more of the history and the setup to what will eventually come. But it's no less interesting. I'll tell you that right now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I love that stuff. So keep exactly. It, exactly. Keep it coming. This one, oh boy, are you not ready for? I wasn't ready for it. I okay. fell down. I fell down a hole. Hence why it's so long. I fell hard and deep into researching the story i was up until like 3 a.m one day just because and out of fun because i was just so curious about it um so i was like you know what let's do a podcast story so for you today i have part one of the legend of flight 571 oh okay so this week's story was given to me by our dear friend dina shout out Shout out. Um, Miss Dina, she has been traveling throughout South America um, the past week. And so she came across this story while she was at a museum there. And she was telling me about it immediately. I was like, got to cover it. You know, she was like, you got to cover it. So um, I did. So our story takes place in Uruguay, South America. And I did title 
this story just the flight number because I don't want to give anything away no spoilers um so you know I called it flight 571 but it's also known as the story of the miracle of the Andes oh so, okay interesting it's a little bit of a legend a little bit of a mystery it's a little bit of a myth all of the above this one okay. kind of fits it all so I do want to give a trigger warning for this week and next week I'll give it again but this story is very dark very oh. dark and yeah. actually um pretty much all of it at least that I know is real you know sometimes we question like is this real is this not real this one there's there's definitely some questions to be asked but most of this information is real so oh wow okay <laughs> take this one <laughs> take this one as you will um so yeah you know if you're not ready to hear a really really dark story maybe just skip this one so yeah but and also yes I am aware that last week I did in fact say that I was going to come this week with a less dark story <laughs> and it's even darker but yeah you, you know, did <laughs> Um, sometimes that just even sometimes it just happens um i was too excited about this one so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anyways let's just get right on into it so it is october 12th 1972 uruguayan air force flight 571 took off from montevideo uruguay and so this was a chartered flight very bougie very fancy for the old christian club rugby team um so the team, along with some of their families and the flight crew, loaded this plane. There were total 45 people on flight, including the crew and everybody. So the plan was they were going to go from Montevideo to Ur Uruguay to Santiago, Chile for their game. And so one confusion, and I'm not really sure if it is rugby or if it's soccer, or if the, it's just lost in translation, because the story is in Spanish, <laughs> so. Okay, so what was a lot of the stuff that you were finding just in Spanish, and you had to translate? Or? Um, well, it's, no, I found English versions of it, but I'm yeah. just saying, like, I'm not sure if what they translate as soccer, because, you know, soccer, football, rugby, I don't yeah. know. I'm not yeah. exactly positive, because when okay. I was telling my parents, they were like, oh, you mean the soccer team? And I'm like, well... The research I found said rugby. So okay. rugby, so it, you know, it's really, that doesn't really matter what sport they were playing. They played okay. a sport yeah. with a ball. Um, and so, yeah, they had a game and they needed to get to Chile for that game. So the pilot in command, his name was Julio Ferrer Ferradas. And he was a very experienced pilot. He had logged over 5,000 hours of flying. Which, if you don't know, that's a lot. That's a whole bunch. I mean, and that, that's like yeah, 5,000 in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I don't know what, how many days that equates to, but that's a lot. A lot. So, yeah. To say the very least, he was very experienced. And he was accompanied by co-pilot Dante Lagorara. And Dante was far less experienced um, than Julio was. But what that's a great pair, you know. Julio can teach him the ropes. Mm -hmm. So originally, the plan was for only the team and the flight crew to fly. And that their families, if they wanted to go to the game, were just going to have to find their own travel there. But it actually turned out that there was 10 extra seats on the plane. So some of them were allowed to bring their family along. And like I said, the flight took off October 12th. But... Once they were up in the air, this huge storm breaks out and they're flying over the Andes Mountains. And it actually was such a bad storm that it forced the plane to stop overnight in Mendoza, Argentina. So just imagine this. The storm was already bad enough they had to stop once. They get off the plane, go to sleep, whatever, wake up the next morning. It's now October 13th and the storm is still bad and conditions hadn't really improved at all since when they landed it the night before but all the weather like apps and all the other things channels all that everybody was saying that the weather was expected to change by the afternoon so they waited and it did get a little better but they were like oh it's only going to get better throughout the day you know how weather people 
be saying that. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were like, you know, we'll wait till the afternoon and then we'll just take off and it'll only get better from there. Um, spoiler alert, I don't know if it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, it seems like it's not going to. It but. seems, yep, it's your, you might be right about that one. So they take off at 2.18 p.m. And I just do need to, in fact, add this in there. Um, I was going to say fun fact. It's not. Not not a fun fact. Um, it's October th- October 13th, 1972. Fell, indeed, on Friday. Which does, in fact, <gasps> make this Friday the 13th oh in October. Gosh. I and... was going to ask you. I was going to ask you if it was Friday the 13th. <laughs> it, oh, my it gosh. It sure was. It sure was. And no connection whatsoever. But I just also thought it might be cool to add that this year... We had Friday the 13th in October. Oh, we did. Yeah. Yeah. So, crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. It is, in fact, Friday the 13th, which makes this even more chilling. Keep that in mind. Um, so, whatever. They take off at 2.18. They're flying. They're chilling. They're above the clouds. So, you know, they're not, you know, dealing with the storm. Not not really. Because they're, they're above that. Um, so, whatever. They're chilling. Everything's going as planned. And the co-pilot radioed the Malar the the Malarque Airport. Sorry if these pronun- pronunciations are not good. You know, you know how we are with that. But mm-hmm. we do try our best. Yeah, but no, anyway. we're trying our best. It's it <laughs> yeah. that sounded right to me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot in here. Um, yeah. So yeah, he radioed the airport to let them know their position, and he told them that they would reach eight thousand two hundred and fifty-one feet high once they got to the planchon pass so this planchon pass is the air traffic control handoff point pretty much it separates the andes mountains kind of in half and it gives jurisdiction to like two separate air places if that makes sense so like when you're flying in a plane and you're a pilot you have to talk to people on the ground and so above the andes mountains is where the like split will be they'll be like okay goodbye Malargue airport and hello whatever the other one's called okay yeah. so yeah so once they cross over this pass they were supposed to radio into the Pudahuel air air traffic control center and then after that they were going to turn north and then descend down into santiago that was the plan now pilot ferradas had flown this exact flight 29 times before which in my opinion is a lot to fly because this is kind of a long flight um to do it 29 times so because he had flown it and known the path so well he was kind of letting dante his co-pilot pretty much pilot the plane because he was like i'm here you know like i'm not gonna let you do anything bad like yeah just getting the experience yeah he needed to learn exactly um yeah, and Dante needed the practice. So he was pretty much piloting. He was pretty much the pilot, even though he wasn't listed as the pilot, if you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, yep. So, yeah, Ferratus was just kind of showing him the ropes. Um, however, due to the storm, the clouds were fully obscuring the Andes Mountains. So they could not see. They like they If they had not known that they were flying over this huge mountain range, they would never have known because they could not see them at all. So this actually caused Dante to make a few of the turns that he needed to make too quickly because he had just assumed that he was where he was supposed to be since they couldn't see. So he just, you know, pulled a left turn a little early, pulled a right turn a little too early. And so, you know, he's thinking he's doing amazing. And the other Mm -hmm. pilot's like, yep, sounds good to me. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. But they're just guessing because they can't actually see anything. And I don't they have their like technology. Well, this is the 1970s, so. Oh no, you're right. right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I didn't even think about. I don't. I don't know if it's not. It's not 2023. Not 2023. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's just kind of how pilots did it back in the day. Like, (laughs) they just can't see. They just have to assume they're doing it right. Which I guess most times it doesn't really matter if you know you make a little turn too early because you're really high up in the sky, right? Yeah. Well. The Andes Mountains are some of the tallest in the world. Let me just tell you that right now. <laughs> um, let's see. So, w- he, Dante, the co-pilot, he's like, okay, 
here it is time time to descend um and land the plane you know at least start getting ready to land the plane or so he thought Mm -hmm. he starts to descend the plane hits severe turbulence because now they're back in the storm that was bad already and when it hit the turbulence it actually was so bad that it hit a downdraft of wind now the storm conditions beyond me i'm no weather person but it was the wind was so strong that it was able to cause this plane to drop several hundred feet within seconds and completely out of the clouds oh what it like drug the plane (gasps) which is scary to me because when i drive and the wind is bad you can feel it pull like your car i can't imagine having the wind pull a plane like when you don't really have any control you know Ooh, Mm -hmm. horrifying horrifying um so when this happens you know was it a blessing was it a curse i don't know but when they are pulled beneath the clouds everybody can now see the mountains that were not supposed to be there um oh wow okay like everybody they were like yeah we're we were made it we're out of the mountains but no they're there and both pilots at this point they see the mountains they're panicked so they try to get the plane back up, elevated back to where it's supposed to be. But the mountains, as I said, far too high. Far too high. And I will save you any more flight talk. But basically, what happened was this plane hit the Andes Mountains multiple times on the way down. They had no time to get it elevated back up to where it needed to be before it just smacked the, the mountain, literally. Um... And, you know, the first Yikes. initial hits of the plane to the mountain, it killed some of the passengers immediately. Um, worst fear ever, not only turbulence or just planes in general, but, you know, one of my worst fears is getting sucked out of a plane. That <gasps> yes. Happened. Oh, my God. That Wait, happened. that happened? Yep. To two people. What? Did the window break or something? So when they hit the mountain, it like ripped off one of the doors i mean the plane was destroyed by the time it got to the ground it hit the andes mountains like five or six times before it landed oh my god yeah i mean it got rocked absolutely see i don't i don't know if it would help but like that's (laughs) why i wear my seatbelt constantly on a plane yeah same like i don't know if like i I guess that would help a little bit right i guess it depends the situation you're in you wouldn't get sucked out the window Probably. Unless the whole seat did get sucked out the door. Well, there's that. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> if, or Because, or, like, you also don't want to be stuck in your seat. <laughs> True. Is also the thing. If you uh, were in a bad yeah. part of the airplane, I kind of feel like it's just a lose-lose. In this situation, it's definitely a lose-lose. Um, but, anyway, continuing on, because we're not done. Not even close. As if all of this that I have just mentioned is not already far too much. It's only going to get worse. The plane finally stops crashing into the mountains and it lands on the ground. But it was a very steep side of a mountain that it landed on. And the Andes are really tall, as I've mentioned multiple times, which means it was icy, snowy, completely iced. And so this plane, once it lands, immediately starts flying down the mountain as if it's a sled with these people. (gasps) Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. I'm just imagining being a person on this. I would, like, pass out oh, 100%. from stress. Like, like, what? None of them were conscious. Like, all of them were hurt so bad. Yeah, and so they think they're done, and they're like, nope, one more ride, guys. <laughs> we're going down this mountain. So they go down the mountain, and eventually it does come to a stop. And the survivors were hit with the reality of what the heck just really happened to them. Um, also... Important to note that the front of the plane was crushed completely. It killed the main pilot immediately when it was crushed. But the co-pilot, Dante, the less experienced one, he actually did not die immediately like the other guy did. And he was begging the passengers to find his pistol and shoot him. But the passengers said that they could not do that. What the hell? I would have to agree with them. What the On that one, like, I'm really, truly not blaming this man fully for this. Like, you know, he really was just an inexperienced pilot flying a hard flight. You know? Yeah. I'm not blaming him for all the deaths. But, like, 
if it's going to be anybody and also in the exact moment that it happened, like, don't ask me to do anything for you, especially not that. No. Sir. No. This is the wrong place and the wrong time for that. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they did not they did not do that. And he, he did succumb to his injuries eventually. So, not good. Um, we started with 45 people on the flight. And at this point in the story, we have 33 remaining alive, which is honestly shocking. Yeah. Um, I thought I thought you would say like 10. Yeah. Right. No, like. No, we got 33. Okay. Right now there will be a live count. I will continue the count uh, while as the story goes on. Um, but obviously, all of them have injuries, some far more severe than others. And I'll spare you some of the details because it's very bad. Very, very bad. But they got very lucky because two people on board were actually medical students and they did survive the initial crash. And so they were basically trying to set up a triage station to help everybody that they could immediately, which is amazing. Um, yeah, shout out to them great. for real. Yeah. Um, one guy had a skull fracture and it actually kept him in a coma for three days. And they did not think he was going to wake up, but they continued to take care of him. And he did actually eventually wake up. We'll get to oh, him. Oh, that's amazing. I know. I know. It's it's crazy. Um, we'll get back to him soon. But um, yeah, this other guy named Enrique, Enrique Platero, he had a piece of metal that was people, they assumed was coming from the outside of the plane somewhere. Um, it was stuck in his abdomen. And when these medical students removed it, they took out a few inches of his intestines with <gasps> the metal. No. But he survived. What? And not only did he survive, once they stitched him up, he immediately began helping others. Oh, mm-hmm. oh my God. So this shout is out to a crazy story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it really, really, really is really wild. So, you may be wondering, does anybody even know these people are missing? yeah no i was totally wondering that yeah (laughs) yeah so the chilean air search and rescue they were notified about an hour after the crash that the flight was missing and this is because the pet like the i forgot what it's called um the planchon pass like the way that they had to switch jurisdictions they i guess they didn't think they made it yet so there was like an hour of time in between before they knew that the plane was fully missing, um, which isn't that bad, mm-hmm. I guess, for 1972. Yeah. But they once they figured out it was missing, they sent out four planes and they searched until dark. They did not find anything. Um, so this began what would end up being a two-month search for this flight. Let me repeat oh, that. my God. Two months. Not days, not even weeks, months. Yep, and it's okay. late October. Yikes! And they're mm-hmm. in the the winter times on this mountain mm-hmm. in the snow. Mm-hmm. Severely injured, severe, <laughs> severely injured. So, um, yeah, and you know, it also it might seem crazy to us that you couldn't find a crashed plane with so many survivors at that time, but everything on the plane was completely destroyed there was really no plane no full plane left intact and the andes mountains is one of the longest mountain ranges in the entire world so it's not like something that you can just it's not like me and savannah's pilot mountain you could just go look at you know and and they were off course yeah exactly they and not even they knew where they were at that point in time so who like they just yeah they could not find them um, so needless to say, after weeks and weeks and weeks of searching, the Chilean Air Force decided that it was time to presume everyone dead. Because obviously, guys, th- think about the weather, you know? Um, and the Chilean Air Force also didn't want to risk any more of the lives of the searchers, because as the searchers are going up in these planes, they're experiencing the same conditions that this plane did. The snowstorms, yeah. all that turbulence, all the stuff. So they're like, we, I mean, those people are dead. They were fully so, convinced. Okay. So after two months, that's when they give up? No, no, no. After about four weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, after about a month, they gave up. Um, 
and presumed everybody dead, told everybody that they were dead. Um, so they decided, now they weren't just going to completely abandon <laughs> these people on this plane. They were like, we're going to wait until the snow melts in December because it's different like seasons there than it is in like where we are. Um, so it was like dead. Okay. It would be summer in winter. Okay. I mean, summer, <laughs> it would be summer in December. So yeah, they were like, we're going to yeah. wait till December when the snow melts to go out there. So then it won't be dangerous for us, which makes complete sense. Um, unfortunately, there were many people still alive that they could have helped if they did continue searching. But again, I completely understand why they did what they did. Yeah. Because I surely would not think that people would have sur- survived this. But um, anyways, so let's see. During the first week out there, um, five more people died. So that leaves 28 surviving out of the regular, I mean, original 45. They, people who, the survivors, they decided to use the debris, all that they could scrounge up together from the plane to make as good a, a shelter that they could. <laughs> as good of, as a home as they could for themselves. Because well, they yeah, did not know, I mean, but they would be out there for two months. Yeah. yeah. Um, they were able to come up with a way, which I think is really cool, to melt the snow so that they would have drinking water. Which oh, that's awesome. Genius. Genius. Yeah. They would use sheet metal from the outside of the plane to reflect the sun onto the snow to melt yeah. it. Okay. Cool. And then, so one of the few, so they were only on this flight, if you remember, to go to this game. So it wasn't like they were going like on a week long vacation somewhere. So they didn't have a lot of stuff on the plane with them, which is also another disadvantage. But one thing that they did have <laughs> was wine. They brought tons of wine. I guess they were going oh, to celebrate the win. Awesome. <laughs> so they were able to drink the wine and use the wine to help clean you know, wounds and stuff since it's alcohol and then use the empty wine bottles to fill up with water. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're seriously like survivor survivors. I mean, truly, that's awesome. truly, truly survivors. Um, like I would now, I would give up immediately. Honestly, like this is, this is crazy <laughs> because, because of something like this, another issue that they came across that I would have never guess would be an issue is snow blindness do you know what snow oh, blindness is yes because everything's so white yeah it's because it's everything just... is so white when the sun shines on the snow it makes it literally it, it's so bright that it blinds you which is so scary yep. and i guess i knew that was a thing but i just didn't realize that it could literally blind you yeah so if they wanted to do anything during the day time which is when they had to do everything because it was so cold. Um, they needed to improvise some sunglasses so that they would be able to see. So they used sun visors from the pirate, pilot's cabin, a wire, and a bra strap to make sunglasses. Oh, my God. This is, like, <laughs> I crazy. I know. That's so awesome. I know. And they also found seat cushions from the plane and tied those to their shoes so that they could have snowshoes so that, that they were able to walk on top of the snow instead of sinking down in. Wow. And I'm like, wow. Oh, y'all are so smart. And until I'm taking notes, okay? I'm taking notes. Because mm-hmm. this is something, you know, that's something I need to know if this ever happens to me. Yeah, I mean, just in case. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so... One of the survivors that is still alive, his name is Nando Parado. So Nando Parado, he is the guy who had the skull fracture who was in a coma for three days. Who they didn't think was going to wake up, but he did. Okay. Yeah, so his name is Nando. Cool name. He woke up on the third day after his coma only to find out that his mom had died in the crash and his sister, who was only 19 at the time, was alive, but she was very, very, very injured. So that's what he had to wake up to. Also a skull fracture amongst, you know, being stranded in the Andes Mountains, you know, yeah. all the other stuff. Oh, horrible. I cannot, cannot imagine. And even though he himself was facing, you know, severe health issues, he tried to keep his sister alive with everything that he had 
but unfortunately she she ended up succumbing to her injuries after eight days which I hate that she had to fight for that long but yes so now we are at 27 survivors and at this point the temperatures are beginning to drop more and more every day to the coldest of negative 34 degrees <gasps> negative oh, 34 my god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh my god Yep, we're facing, like, the brunt of the winter at like, this Like, do point. they have anything to keep warm? They have no medical supplies, except for a literal um, first aid kit, which they had already used all of. Um, they had hardly any food, hardly any clothes, period, but they didn't have any cold weather clothing. Because they were just going to play soccer, you know? They didn't have winter clothes. They weren't going hiking in the Andes. And on top of all of that, they were only able to make three sunglasses for the snow blindness. So that means only three people could be outside in the day doing actual work that needed to be done for an entire nearly 30 people trying to be alive. So, unfortunately, that is where I will leave you. <laughs> oh my gosh, this, this is week. really just like, oh, I want to know more. I know. I really know. I'm so sorry. But if you come back next week, you will have all the answers. At I least mean, all I'll the be back. That we have. I'm, I'm I'll, so glad to hear it, Savannah. I'll be back next week. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I need to know. <laughs> so glad to hear it. But yeah, that is part one of The Legend of Flight 71. 571. So. Wow. I just, oh my gosh. <gasps> will I they survive? How Who will survive? How will okay, they survive? Okay, no, I need to know. know how they make it out of this, because I'm betting, like, at least one person. Like, because who else is going to tell their story, mm, you know? That's the question. So, I will I'm like, go ahead who's going to make it out? There will be at least one survivor. Yeah, so. okay. Ugh, I'm mm -mm -mm. so... It's kind of like the Hunger Games, and I didn't even do that on purpose. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Like, it's actually not really anything like it, but I'm just no, it's like, more like fighting for your life. It's like Survivor. Like, yeah, it actually yeah. is Survivor, quite literally. So, yeah. Or like the show Lost, yeah. except okay. they're on, they're in the snow and not on a not on the island. Beach. I was yeah. about to spoil Lost, but then I was like, maybe let me not do that, even though it came out literally 20 years ago. Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> I The ending sucked, is that what yeah. you're going to say? Yeah, because I was going to be like, well, <laughs> but... No, yeah, I won't. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> I won't do it. It's nothing like Lost, let me tell I you mean, that. I mean, I know what you're going to say, and people yeah. who have seen it know what you're going to yeah. say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're all collectively shaking our heads, like, yes, we know what Taylor Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yes. Anyways, go to our Instagram to see pictures of our stories this week. You're going to want to, because, you know, this time we're actually going to have real pictures. Um, so that's exciting. Sometimes we just have renderings, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And check out our YouTube. Leave us a comment. You know, mm -hmm. we like hearing from you. And rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Yes. But I suppose other than that, I don't really have anything else this week. What about you, Savannah? Uh, nope. Okay, well then I guess we will see you guys next week. Cue the music.